So, I am Bill Hurd. I am a recovering Commodore engineer, as I say. Hi, Bill. <laughs> I, I keep going back to the first one. It's, my life's a mess. So, no, it's, uh, I've, I've often referred to Commodore as a Greek tragedy in three acts. Right? So I'm from Act Two. I'm that part in the middle where I'm from that group of engineers that knew what it was like to work for Jack Tramiel and knew what it was like after Jack left. So, and, and obviously Jack leaving, you, you, know, you know, down goes the company, right? Also, I've never done a PowerPoint about Commodore before. I, I was at the Atlantic thing and I showed up like at the last minute and I just waved my arms and talked for an hour. <laughs> so we're trying to do something structured here and it could really suck, so my apologies. <laughs> but just as, uh, you know, the, the, the stages of death, right? Acceptance, denial, bargaining. We did add the stage of vandalism to it because we did this ourselves. We, if you ever heard the term chicken lips, it, that's our own word for, for this logo. And then, of course, finally, you can't unsee this image. Uh, but that's Commodore for you. So, we, you know, I see all these things on TV, and they, you know, I watched a show about the 80s, and they, Apple, 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 nothing against, well, a lot against Apple, but, you know. <laughs> But, you know, we, we had the highest selling machine there was. It's still in the Guinness Book of Records, Commodore 64, 27 million sold. And Apple, 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 they mentioned IBM once. So, and, and to the, the reason why is simple. We're not around, right? So when I do go to somebody and say, I used to say, do you remember Commodore? And some people nod their heads. And then finally I'd go, did your parents own a Commodore? And they, oh yeah, there's something up in the case. And now I don't even say it, because nobody, you know, it's like 35 years later. But they don't know what, like, telephones are, either, like physical telephones. You know, I posted something about, <laughs> you know, there was no voicemail, there was nothing back right. then. If you missed the call, you missed the call, right? right? And it's, so, no, I, I start by talking about how I got my job at Commodore. It was sheer luck, right? Because I was your basic high school dropout, except I lived near the uh, principal, so he sent home my diploma two years later. And, but I fixed things. I fixed CBs, I fixed TV. I was licensed TV repairman at the age of 17. So I was into electronics, but had I stayed in Indiana, I'd be fixing combines, because there's no technology in Indiana. So I ended up out in Pennsylvania. I worked at a company called Pennsylvania Scale Company where we used the 6502. And being a, an adventuresome kid, I learned everything I could about it. And they ended up having to bring me into engineering because I was writing papers when they would misuse a part. And for example, our battery backup wouldn't work. I'm like, you used the wrong chip select. This one's for battery back. I'd write it up and present it rather than whine and bitch about it. And they're like, we got to get this guy in here. He's writing these papers. So I ended up designing digital scales using the O2. And then me and my boss stopped getting along badly. And a guy named Headley Davis, who went on to do like the Xbox and some of those things, he said, uh, hey, there's this company, um, you know, go up 202 to King of Prussia, and they're, they're, you know, they're hiring. I went to one of those headhunter things, and I did badly with the first guy, this guy, uh, Ray, Hugh, Ray oh, I can't remember his last name, uh, but he was on the Z8000 project, and I was trying to impress him really hard, and I tried too hard, and he was like, get the hell out. So my next and last guy I interviewed with was Bob Russell, who part of the VIC-20 team and stuff. And the point where everything changed was he said, well, I might do a load X05, and I'm, or a load X immediate 02, and I'm like, A502. You know, I'm muttering the opcodes under my breath. And he looked at me and he started saying them, and I started repeating them back in the mnemonics. So that was the moment when his body language changed and I knew I had a job. Well, I shouldn't say I knew I had a job. I knew I wasn't getting thrown out right then and there. So I threw in a graphic because, you know, I couldn't even read a phone number because I was bite swapping in my head back then, you know, where you take the two. And, you know, I saw the, uh, the TV show uh, uh, about Atari. Um, what, what was the one about the ET uh, cartridge? Yeah. Game over, Game over, thank you. And they showed, they showed where the guy walked up to the Atari building. Well, this is what I walked up to. This was the MOS building, right? Fran Blanche took this. And I made the mistake of parking on the wrong side of the building the first day. Well, we had polluted the groundwater. 
And so they had these aeration things that was part of the massive cleanup. So they're spraying this stuff. Well, it's, it, it formed on my car and made a sticky residue. And I'd even parked under a tree, so now I had leaves stuck in the sticky residue in my, my car. And, and, you know, but that's the things you learned about MOS, like where to even park and stuff. We were, in, we were in offices where it was three to an office. So we'd have four, except you needed a door, you know, in, into the office. And we didn't care. We're working at Commodore now, right? You walk down the halls, and there's game sounds coming out of every door. And some people are even working. The rest are just playing games. After they put me in a chair and said, congratulations, you're now writing code for this new disk drive because Benny Pruden was out for a week. I couldn't stay in the chair. I start wandering the halls, and I ended up looking at a, at a thing called the TED. Anybody, who knows what the TED is? All right, tell me what the TED is. Uh, Wrong. Sounds close. Yes, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, did you say just sound? Or, so TED, text display chip, right? So it was for the plus four, whip, God, I'm even saying the plus four. It was for the 264, which was Jack Tramiel's next computer. Well, it didn't make sense to do the C64 again. It's, already, it's the highest selling computer, why would we? But he was after Clive Sinclair over the, uh, over the um, uh, Spectrum, right? He wanted that spot. So the, the TED was supposed to be Based, I mean, it, it, it was today's Raspberry Pi, if you think about it, right? It was everything in a, in a chip. And um, uh, it, it was supposed to cost, well, I'll get to the slides. This is the problem with doing slides here. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyways, there's this guy that's on the project, and he's made up a TED design, except it's got a VIC chip in it. And, and it's wire wrapped. So this is what the stuff looked like when we did back then. It's not going backwards, but I can deal with that. So what happens is I started talking about shared bus. I walked into the hardware lab, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Are you, are you getting on and off the bus at the same time as the video processor? And it goes, what do you know about that? Well, I had done one at home, right? And that's, that's what one of the slides was. And so before I knew it, I'm in charge of the TED project because he's leaving. So the only reason I'm in charge of the TED project was I couldn't stay in the chair. I walked off to the thing, and I, I had known. See, when, when you did a 6845, everybody, anybody know what the 6845 is? Yeah, it's, a, it's the graphics processor of the day, a great process. Well, normally, you could only write to it during the vertical retrace time, so it was very slow. But a shared bus allowed you, and this is the thing I had done at home, using. but a shared bus allowed the, the VIC processor, for example, to get on, and then our processor to get on. So because I knew that, and that's the whole beauty of the VIC chip, is we share the bus with the memory simultaneously. And this is, this is the bugger we were after. Uh, Shiraz Shivshi had taken me into his office, opened his Commodore brand file cabinet, we were just talking about this, and put this, plopped this out and said, this is who we're after. So for 49 bucks, this, this was it. I mean, uh, you know, we catch a lot of crap for, for the TED family for the plus fours and stuff. But, but at the day, so we had 121 colors. Anybody know why we didn't have 128? Yes? Yeah, eight, eight shades of black is still black. <laughs> so we had 121 colors, sound and all that, except, you know, it had a chiclet keyboard, but it was supposed to sell for $49. And this was the entire family. It actually looks like we put some time into thinking about this, right? Because Jack Tramiel still works here. And so he was, you know, would have done the marketing, the follow through and everything. And at the time, it's called a 264. Anybody know what the 364 does? Yes? It has a speech synthesizer. Speech synthesizer. Who, who made the speech synthesizer? It was the guys that did the speak and spell. We had, we had stolen them. They were very cool people. Got them drunk. <laughs> so we had, and we were doing a, uh, 
a, a desktop motif. So guess what? Apple didn't invent a desktop motif. We were doing one too. It was called Magic Desk, and we had Magic Voice. And the idea was you could do office, uh, you know, office business stuff. You want to do games? Go play a 64. You want to do office stuff that was supposed to be this. So I threw this in just because this is what the guys worked on, right? It took them like six revs to even get one working. But this is the TED chip itself. You can even see it says up there in the TED. But this, is, this was our magic, right? We made chips. I know because the crap's on my car from the process of making the chips. And so it's like, it, it, you know, we, one of my things I have about Apple is you just used our chips. Now, they'll, they'll say it's different, but that's, that's my take on it. And this is what it really looks like. Actually, I did this for Hackaday. This is what they did when they looked through the microscope. This is the kind of thing they saw, was, you know, was just shades of this. Well, my, I think it was my first week there, I'm in the hardware lab. Or, I'm sorry, the chip lab. And then guys at the microscopes, and I'm just kind of watching, he goes, okay, turn on the, turn on the light. Okay, turn off the light, we're in NTSC mode. I'm like, did you just use the light of the microscope to flood the bit on the chip and it flips states? They go, yeah, mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I am so in the right place. This is so cool. Well, what they had done was, back then, we didn't have the rules for checking this stuff, the automatic checks. So when you look at this, this was all hand checked. They would take huge pieces of paper, put them on the you know, plots, vellum and stuff even, and sit there with a scale and measure it. So a designer would spend a month designing a circuit, and then he'd spend four months making sure each and every transistor was lined up just right, the right length, not shorten out and stuff. So we didn't have the automatic tools today. We just pump it in and say what we want, and the tools do the work for us. So we had a design rule check that would say if something got too close. But what the design rule check wouldn't do is if you shorted right across them, it, that's a perfect short. Go for it, man. So uh, this is what had happened. They had shorted A10 across like A9, 8, and 7, so you couldn't write to the NTSC bits. So that's why they were flooding it with light so they could still talk to the chip because it'd take another quarter million dollars and three or four weeks to spin the chip to do another rev of it. So I saw somebody had calculators out there. This is cool. So my second week at Commodore, Shiraz, my boss, says, go downstairs. And the reason I got picked was he saw me first. Shiraz was really well known. It's like if he went by you in the hall and a little scrap of paper drifted to the floor and you'd pick it up, it'd be your work assignment, even, no matter how busy you were. So he would actually come in the lab and you see the rest of us ducking out the back door of the lab, you know, if we were busy. But he said, go down and make a deal with the guys from, um, from MOS. So I go down, and I've got my, I was so proud of my calculator. It's a little HP. You had to, I had to twist it and turn it to make the LEDs light up just right and stuff. <clears throat> um, the numbers would change. You know, the segments would go out. And the battery wasn't very good. So we're there, and they're like, well, if we have a RAS pre-charge of 110, and I'm typing away, and well, or the, and then my calculator died. I'm looking around the room. I don't want them to know it died. I don't want them to know I'm now useless. But then I noticed that they're doing something I'm not. They're playing poker. They're not typing on calculators. They're going, what about 160 and watching my reaction? So I realized, I said, wait, wait, stop. What do you need? And what do you mean? You've got a problem, obviously. How can I help you fix it? They're like, well, okay, the, we, we blew it and this thing. I said, I can live with that. Just give me something here. And they said, really? I said, yeah. Since then, I got along with the guys at MOS really good. They would invite me up. They'd show me the process. we talked talk about where the chips were failing and the chips failed a lot. But, they, but that was just my second week there. It was, it was cool because had my calculator not failed, I probably would have blown it because I, I didn't take the time to look around and see that everybody was playing poker with me. Now, we had designed the, plus, the TED at the time of Jack Tramiel, and Jack had said, somebody had gone up the mountain, come down with a stone tablet, and said, there shall be nine chips. 
Well, I look at it and said, you need a reset. I knew this from working at that scale company I talked to, you know, mentioned. They said, you can't put a reset in there. Jack said nine chips. Well, the reality is Jack just meant the minimum number of chips. But I said, you need this. And they said, been nice working with you. So I'm putting it in. They said, nice working with you again, right? Um, I didn't get fired. They went to him and said, we need this new reset circuit. And so that's how I've started to finally make my mark. Because I'm just a kid at this point, right? I'm 22, 23. So meanwhile, the Commodore 64 legacy that we had inherited. Uh, you all see the sparkle on a 64? Uh, early models. So they put a Tiger team together um, to, to fix it, a fix-up team, whatever they'd call it. And one of the things they did was, you know how the 64 screen is light blue on dark blue? Well, they made it so it's dark blue on dark blue on all the cells that don't have characters in it. So it's still sparkling its ass off. It's just blue to blue. You can't see it. So those are the kind of things they were doing to fix it. Meanwhile, the people in production are tacking capacitors on these vital control signals, and we're not allowed in production to see it. They, they, would, fiz they would have the, the, the security guys come down and take us, there's engineers in production, you know, and come take us out. So finally, I, I hit it off with one of the guys at a bar, naturally. And, and I said, we can help you. <laughs> yeah. I know you're putting capacitors on them. Um, can, let's talk. And so we did. We finally started getting that communication going. So by the time the 128 dropped and stuff, um, I had the guys in QA downstairs were asking us questions, which was great. Um, I've seen, see, we had this thing. You got to ship it by Christmas. We didn't care what or how or if it was broken or what. I've seen a skid of broken 64s. Sign said broken. That's how I know they were broken. Later, the signs laying there and the 64s are out on a trailer being shipped for Christmas, right? And I've seen this. Because we figured if you brought it back to us, hey, we still sold you one. Yeah, we'll fix it in January for you. We also, then later, we did tricks like we would ship to the 18-wheelers out on our property. Well, you're not supposed to do stuff like that. You know, as soon as you ship it, you get to count it as an asset or, you know, money. Well, they're on our own property. So, wait a minute, we didn't really ship it. Well, the security guards went into business for themselves and started emptying them from the other side. <laughs> so, they go out and they open it and all these empty, uh, uh, empty, uh, um, 18-wheeler tra tractors are out there, and so here come the FBI, and, and you know, it's like the four times when I was there when the FBI came through, right? So we were always doing crap like that. The, when I first, um, you know, got there, the, the rev of the chip, of the VIC chip was sparkly, even, even without the things I was talking about. And if you set your 64 down or you used a VIC chip in your design and you went to lunch, you'd come back they, they would not only steal it, they'd put their old one back in for you. So, but it's useless, it's sparkly. I mean, the theft of people that worked at Commodore stealing the VIC chips to take home for their own C64s. So one of the things I did was I ordered up a tube. It turns out you can order up from downstairs. You call, I'm from R&D department. And so I had two tubes of VIC chips put on the counter with the sign that said, take one. And they went, doo, 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 doo. you know, they finally, I saturated the market. And then I could leave my own sitting out without fear that somebody would steal it. So again, I'm trying to change the commoner culture, right, of just, <laughs> this is mine. So um, anybody know about the PLAs, the, the, the failures? Have you ever seen what? So we had one part. We stole it. It was made by Signetics, the 82S100. That was the PLA, Programmable Logic Array, that basically did all the, the jungle uh, logic in, in the C64. And the reason I know we stole it, once you walk in the chip lab, there's a piece of cardboard with um, Polaroid photographs that they had taken through the microscope, showing all the edges and all the cells and everything like that. So it's a pretty good design, except we didn't make it very good. The, the passivation, that insulative layer that goes on the top, anybody know what was wrong with it? I only learned this five years ago. 
We, th we thought it was just, because what would happen is it'd get crud in there. It's like getting mold in your bathroom when it's in your chip. And you can see it under the microscope. Um, but there was too much boron, right, turns out, in this protective layer. And so these PLAs were only lasting about um, nine months in the field. So, you know, they, so when I talk about the C64 being, oh, the most sold units, we also, we had like the most failed units too. I'll, I'll be honest about that part. They eventually fix that. So during the days of, of Jack Tramiel, for the TED, which is the plus four, the C, C16, C116, all those things, we did do a development board to get out to the developers ahead of time, a year ahead of time. And if you'll notice, here's even the Atari joystick ports, because everybody, do we all love the joystick port on the TED series, right? That little DIN connector, son of a bitch. <laughs> well, when, there were no joysticks back then, so we had to put the Atari joysticks on there. But this appeared, somebody showed this on the internet a couple years ago, and I freaked. Because that's my handwriting from 30 years ago. <laughs> That's, that's a kid's handwriting, but it's mine. Um, and, and look at this, we have a chip that's got the lid taped on. Wow. Wouldn't you like to work at a place like that? <laughs> it, just, it, it shows up, it still smells like baked, coffee, or baked, you know, baked goods. They just got finished making it. But I can even tell when I wrote this, because when I went to Japan then, uh, like probably about five months after this, I started crossing the Ds. Because I was always, people think my name was Hero because my D looked like an O. So I can even, it's like, oh, 1983, after the rains, you know, before I went to Japan. So I can even tell exactly when I signed that. So see these diodes? I had learned, I hung out with the chip guys. I drank with them. I fought with them. We had a good time. But I learned what they needed and what they did. And when you go to test a chip, it has to start from a known spot, right? When you put a chip in a chip tester, and I'm talking at the MOS plant. So what they did was they tried to sneak in a reset pin, where if you, if you tied it to eight volts, it would go in a reset. Thought they were being cool, didn't tell me. Well, chip guys forget about high impedance and noise. So if you touch this with your finger, it'd go in a reset. If you put your hand on the monitor and just waved your hand around it, it'd go in a reset, it'd sparkle. And so I said, I, all I did was I tied diodes on it. I found out the two terminals, tied diodes to the plus five, so it couldn't go above plus five once it was in, I, they, they might even be germanium diodes, like 0 0.3 volts above the, and then I go and get them and said, ha ha, you, tried, you used pins 11 and 12 for reset, didn't you, you son of a bitch. And they're like, how'd you know? So I, I had to show them this. So for our longest time, we had to put diodes on these chips to make them work. But it, it, this is within when the chip guy started learning. Well, let's tell Herd. He seems to have some good input from time to time about how to do this. All right. Who here has heard the joystick stories before? So here, you tell it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so I met Ira Velinsky, who did the design, which is, it was a cool design. But in, if you ha look in the sideways of this, it's a real small piece in there. So kids will break this. And he goes, no, it's designed. And I said, no, I'm, I'm a maniac, and I know I can fix it or break it. And so rather than argue with him, I let the attention shift to the other side of the table. And then suddenly you hear, snap! And I'm, I'm going, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I had broken the, chip, the, the joystick to make a point. It is a $20,000, it's called a soft tool. So, I mean, I, I just threw away a bunch of money to make a point. But the, the thing was, it really was harder to break than I thought, but I wasn't going to let that stop me from making my point. <laughs> I, you know, to, so, no, but that was, that was, you know, so I started getting along with the guys from Japan, too. So, first time I ever got threatened with losing my job. You wouldn't know it from looking at this slide, right? 
Remember, I had inherited the design, so I don't say I'm the designer of the 264, the plus four. I was the lead engineer, because I took it over. If anybody really designed it, it was the chip guys, because it's a chip with some circuitry around it. So they're, they're architects. I had been carrying the schematics with me. I had looked at every part of the schematic, and I missed the point, this chip wasn't there, that the data lines from the processor went to the keyboard. To a chip guy, this makes sense, right? Because here's the TED chip. They're thinking of, well, it's just, it's just or we're doing the outputting, we're doing the hard work. You just read it with the data lines on the processor. Well, that sucks for FCC, because if you think of a, here's the, here's the keyboard, right? It's got processor speed signals flying around. But the real thing was, one, some of those signals went down the joystick port, and when you put the joystick near the TV, <laughs> it'd start flickering and doing all kinds. Of, I mean, you could crash. I said, really? Well, then I should be able to actually crash the processor. And it did. It just <laughs> Well, I start laughing. My boss is like, what's funny? Remember, I'm carrying these schematics around. I own them now, right? Even the, I said, the data lines go to the keyboard. <laughs> The data line goes to the joystick. So now the data line's gone all the way down the joystick cable, right? So, and, and that's not something the chip designers thought about. They were thinking of this little C16, you know, proximity of this thing. And, and here I'm shooting it way down the, so I'm laughing. And my boss said, fix it or you're fired. Okay, I'm young upstart, I can, I can do that. He walks in not an hour later. And I'm playing this game, sitting there like this. He doesn't notice the, you know, I, I threw this in for the effects of the, of the monitor, because this is the yoke, this is the scary part, looking part of a TV, right, monitor. And he said, I thought I saw, told you to fix it. I said, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, why aren't you working on it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm still playing the game. And he gets mad, I'm, I'm about to get fired. Finally, I showed him that we had put a 25-foot joystick cable on it, and I had wrapped it around this part of the monitor to prove that we were now immune to it. So we had added a chip to it, but I, it's like this frickin' manager, man. I'm like, what, you think I'm ignoring you, or why don't you follow that cable around, wrapped around the back of the monitor and comes out and, and, and is actually working. So we did fix, I had to add another chip to the 264, but it was one of our chips. So it doesn't count, right? If you make your own magic, you can use your own chip, if I had to use like TI or something, that would have that would have screwed us. The who who here's used a 264 plus four, even Seema? You ever used the ROM monitor that's built in that? We gave you the ability to do development right in it, right? We got a telex from Commodore England that said you've now developed the perfect tool for, you know, hacking software. I sent her a telex back. Remember telexes? I said, thank you. <laughs> Took it as a compliment. I still say TX, THX for thanks and stuff. That tell. It's before faxes, but the... You could dump the RAM? To... Yeah, the monitor built right in. You could disassemble the, the, the very monitor itself. You could change contents. Um, the guys loved it, they developed it. Um, they just never took it out then. Why wouldn't we leave that in? So yeah, it was it dis disassembled. I mean, it was a great troubleshooting tool because you could write right to the I/O and stuff. Um, we we had some issues. We had uh, um, Terry Ryan wrote a, a memo about the TED about the raucous squawking noises that came out of it. Well, it turns out when they went to do the white noise, they thought that the registers would wake up randomly. They don't because of physical variations in the chip. So instead of going. What it did was, we thought it was cool. <laughs> Terry thought it was Rosh's squawking noises, so he wrote the memo that got him in trouble for a long time. But then I saw this. That, so we go to the CS show, and one of the things that happened was a woman came up to me and said, you I, she said, I just spent like a year and a month writing this educational software for the C64, and your new computer won't run it. And I, I kind of took that to heart. I was like, you know, this is somebody's livelihood, right? But I earned that, mostly successful CES show. 
And years had gone by where I started to think, well, was Jack really a part of it? Was there really a 364, the voice one? Because we, we never sold it. And then Chris from the New York Times brought me this at the BCF out east. And there, there's Jack DeMille. He, he quit the next day. So this is his second to last day. And there he's holding a 364 and a 264. And literally, I didn't put that in his hands, but I worked on it right before the guy who put it in his hands did it, right? So when this picture showed up, I was like, there was a Jack DeMille. <laughs> there was a 364. There was a 264. So has everybody heard the story of how Jack ended up quitting? So he, um, he got in an argument. Um, I, I can actually tell this now. Um, Leonard Trammell had told me, his son, um, how, how he ended up quitting, but I wasn't allowed to tell anybody that wasn't from Commodore until now that both Jack and Irving Gould have both passed away. He said, it doesn't matter now. But they had gotten in an argument. Uh, Irving Gould, you know, liked the pet jet, which was our private airplane, as his own private as, you know, service. And Jack Tramiel's work ethic was simply not that. You didn't take, when, when Jack went to the lunchroom, he paid with cash like all of us. I mean, you know, you didn't use the company as a, as a piggy bank. Well, him and Irving got, didn't get along with that. And so Jack did what he had done to other employees. He said, well, then I'm out of here. And he was. So they, they left CES this next day over that. And I just remember Leonard Tramiel talking about his dad pulling away in the Corvette that they had got him for his birthday. They had spent months like getting this thing and just Jack's last day, you know. And so when you worked for Jack Tramiel, you, you didn't even need to talk with him or met him. You knew who you worked for though. He, he had like this presence, his voice, this Jack attacks, right? You, the whole areas would get fired and things like that. So, you know, I like to say that the blade swung this high and I was only this tall. So I, I never got Jack attacked, um, but, but that was his legacy there. So here, here was what Jack had done, you know, this thought out line. After he leaves marketing, who evidently don't want to do marketing because they haven't had to, the C64 sold itself after probably the first 12 million. It's just selling itself, right? Well, what we need is another Commodore 64. Do any of these look like a Commodore 64? Well, the drive looks kind of like a 1541. So we end up with a 232, half the RAM, same cost. <laughs> Marketing's brilliant. The, the 264 becomes the plus four. Anybody know the difference between a 264 and a plus four? Yeah, it's, it's $250 is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, seriously, so it was supposed to sell for 79 and now they're trying to sell it for like 299, right? Who would buy this thing? And then they do this. I, I think somebody has one of these out there, right? The C16? Does this look like a Commodore 64? Yeah, so that's where this came from. This was marketing's idea. So I ended up having to sign off on it, but so inadvertently now, I've, I've been the project engineer for like seven or eight computers in just a year and a half, right? So, so here's the project I went to next. Anybody recognize that? You ever see one in person? I have one. This one's mine. Jeff Porter's got two. He hasn't taken the batteries out in 30 years. You should see all the crap in it. And we laugh. We're, the engineers make the worst collectors. As a matter of fact, usually when I have my bin of computers, you know, because I, I wave instead of doing this, I wave them around. And then I'll throw it in the bin and everybody in the room will cringe. And I'll be like, make you nervous? <laughs> I bend pins, they break off in my hands. You know, we saw them work 35 years ago. I don't, you know, we don't need to see. I haven't even turned this on to see if it works, because as long as I don't, it might. <laughs> What's that? Yes, it is. It's, it's, I haven't collapsed the wave function to, for it to figure out which way it goes. So this was, but this was going to be a cool computer, right? We'd done the 64. We blew the business machine. So now we're doing a portable. I mean, we're, we're giving it phone lines. I mean, this is, uh, who, who's, uh, uh, Jason's got silent 700 for an email address. Well, we had a silent 700 in, in our lab, and we were paying 1000 bucks a month for renting it. 
And this is the only computer I ever saw that had, at the time, that had phone jacks on it. We gave it a barcode. I mean, it was, it was going to be cool. Before Jack had left, we had bought a LCD company. We were the only American manufacturers of glass, as we called it. It was Eagle Pitcher. So they were actually not far from us. So who else could make a, an LCD computer but us, the way we could have, using all the, you know, everything that Commodore was? So this would have been a next evolutionary step, I felt. This was the next coolest computer to do. And uh, let's see if we have So we even, we were starting to invent things. In the 80s, you can invent things. We had function key saw, you know, where the, fu the function keys changed the value, you know, based on what's on the screen. We all take that for granted now. Oh, excuse me. Um, and, and I had designed an MMU, a memory management unit, so that what was on the screen was actually just, you, you changed a pointer in memory. So instead of scrolling, you, you know, in the old days, scrolling looked like this, right? It was slow. We're just moving a pointer. It's fast. So it, this is the kind of things we were designing into this. One day in the lab, I'm sitting there, I'm working on the LCD machine. I, I, we had hired Jeff Porter away from AT&T um, because he knew how to make modems. So he was a natural fit for the LCD machine. I'm sitting there working on something, and I keep hearing behind me, I hear an engineer keep going, I don't understand. It's starting to annoy me. And Fred Bowen's with him, who wrote the kernel uh, for, the, for the TED series. And he's trying to calm him down, but the logic analyzer keeps lying to the guy. I don't understand. Finally, I get pissed. I turn around. I look at it, I go, you've got contention. When, when two things happen at once, the logic analyzer says, I'm confused, you know, and it, it lies to you, right? But it lies to you in a regular way. I said, give me your thing. He had done a PLA, like we've already discussed, and he had faxed it crooked. I'm uh, faxed, he had photocopied it crooked and cut off a whole column of terms. So I said, look, look, you, you're missing a one and a zero here, they're continuing now. Shut up. I turned and Fred Bowen's looking at me over his glasses. <laughs> He's like, I looked at him again. I said, what are you working on anyways, right? So what they were working on was going to be called the D128. It was going to be called, or it was going to be based on the 6509, because hey, why would we use our most popular processor? It did this funny banking where, about the only thing you could do, it's like it was the equivalent of if you put, your, 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 you put some notes in a uh, suitcase and threw it in the hallway and then jumped mode, you jumped over to that 128K bank, that other 64K bank, I mean, and then you could open the thing and look in it, right? It sucked, in other words. It was going to be based on the VIC-2, which is a 40-column chip, but they wanted color, color, and there's no code base. It would have been starting from scratch. So me and Freddie start talking about me working on this project. And real quick, some things happened. Let's make it 6502 based. Why don't we use the MMU from the LCD I've been working on? Let's add 80 columns. Oh, why don't we make it C64 compatible? And I say that because that woman, that memory came back to my mind when she said, I worked a year and a month on this software and it won't run on your new machine. And I wanted, in my mind, I wanted to support that community of people that supported us. So by making it compatible, not only is my bigger, better brother, the C64, you know, I've, I've got some, but, but the people who buy this machine can still run that woman's software, in, in my mind. We added a SID, hey, C64, and we started doing clock speed doubling. This 128 can run twice as fast as a 64 in certain modes. We, we wanted to do the built-in floppy. I mean, we, we love the SX-64. Who here has seen one or had one? SX, oh, nice machine, isn't it? The handles are a little fragile. So. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I sh fr fractured an ankle one time, like with it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and me, I wanted a reset switch on it. <laughs> so when we were done, we said, it's not a D120 anymore, it's a C128. So now I'm officially on the C128. We didn't even tell management we had changed the name of it. They found out a couple weeks later. 
And that became key in doing this project was we stayed in front of management because if we let them catch up to us, they would start making decisions for us, right? And we, we saw what they did to the tail end of the TED series. So the, the 128 was one of those rare machines where a kid sat down and designed it on a piece of paper, not a group of people. I mean, I added uh, two guys, you know, what happens there is as you get up steam, you get to add to your team. But at the time, it was just me. So I designed the 120. So when I say I'm the designer of it, I had my little engineering pencil, and I would wear the wristband so I wouldn't smear the paper. And I'd do it all on that 0.1 grid on, on a B-sized piece of paper. And I didn't show it to management. So I'm going, well, if we're doing a new machine, we should add an MMU. I almost did the first MMU in a home product. I blew it though. I didn't add a supervisor mode. So it does everything an MMU really does, but there's no supervisor. Uh, we added a PLA. We added our own version of a VIC chip. We had our own process, you know, own, another version of this uh, 8502 of the 6502. We needed, of course, new font ROMs. And we added this 80 column controller, which almost sunk the whole thing. But so now I've got five months to finish this, because this is August, and I've got five custom chips that I need to get done. So when we went to prototype, we didn't have time to wire, I mean, wire wrapping it would have been stupid, uh, because we'd have spent all our time troubleshooting the wire wrap, right? So, and also, we couldn't wait for the chips to get done for the programmers to start. It, you know, the chips that get done, like in December, we got to show it in January. So we, in the meantime, we had to design emulators for the chips. So you popped a chip out and you stuck this whole PC board plugged in in its place. Um, FCC, and we needed to do FCC application. We had to start that in November. So even as we're, we were on a five month project, even as we're racing to, to CES show, uh, we've got FCC. Um, you know, being designed into it too. So the talk is where, remember I was trying to change the culture, right? So I was, uh, um, sat th I, I took the chip guys, sat them down. I took Terry, remember Rosh's squawking noises, Terry? I said to, the, I, I told him, I said, you, pointed at Terry, I said, you can ask that chip guy for anything you want early on and he'll give it to you. Now, at the end of the project, you will have to cover all his mistakes, right? Because we can fix it in software till the very last minute. And once they put it like that, he's like, okay, because they were real resentful at, oh, chip's broken again, we had to write a patch. Oh, well, that's the only way we're going to get done in five months. Was, we're going to make mistakes, and it'll be your job to fix them last. I can fix them second to last because I can patch a PC board up to a certain time, but at the end of the day, you can replace a ROM and, and we can't. I actually have my own version of a 6502, because I screwed up. <laughs> we wanted, on the 6502, there's a pin that comes out um, for the logic analyzer. So we've stuck it in a 48 pin pack, and when we pinned it out, the wires didn't reach. So these, little, these elderly women would sit at microscopes and hand bond these chips. There's a whole room full of them. Talk about magic. Well, they had to turn it 45 degrees to make all the wires reach. So they, it looked like a tie tack, but this, this is one of the things we did. All right, CPM cartridge. Anybody ever run CPM on a C64 or 128? Yeah, I know you did. It's, yeah, well, they didn't work. <laughs> um, they had a problem, and so either it worked or it didn't, and it came out to there was a certain brand of one of these chips, and I'll talk about it a little bit. But there was a high failure rate. I actually still have the memo at home. And when I plugged it into a 128, it didn't work at all. Um, just the timings had changed. So what I'm thinking is, well, wait, I've got to add. This thing pulls a half an amp. I've got to add a half an amp to a power supply, which means I'm making the whole thing pricier, but I'll never, <coughs> I won't use it most of the time. I got this failure rate, and complete failure on first, and, and it didn't work. 
So I took the Z80 out. I actually had to go find my Sinclair that I used to hold my door open, because we used them as door stops, tear the Z80 out, and wired it in. I didn't tell management, right? Because remember, stay in front of them. Don't, go, don't give them a chance to get caught up to you. And so the very first um, version of this, the very first uh, PC board has the Z80 built right in it. And that's when I told them it had a Z80, because now they can't take it out, right? So here's the first prototype. Look, look at this thing. In my memory, there's like two or three jumpers. So I pull this out and I look at it, I'm like, holy shit. I can't believe management knows I'll get this working in five months. Now it's down to four months when this PC board came out. We had three boards, a long-haired kid, and uh, four months to make CES show. And, and my boss's uh, bonuses all depend on us getting done. So I don't know what made him more nervous is looking at this, and this is what it looked like with all these emulators plugged in. Do you even see the main PC board under here? Here's, this is the PLA emulator, this is the MMU emulator, this is, oh, I don't even know, what, that's VIC chip emulator. Here's the tower for the 8563 to make it work. And here's what I look like at the time. <laughs> I'm the one in the long hair and the short shorts. So that, that kind of gives the idea of you know, the, the environment. Here's, here's management watching us going, you're going to get done, right? So who here knows electronics? Anybody? <laughs> my, I got a nosebleed after designing this. I think I had some blood coming out of my ears. And I, I heard a ringing noise, and it wasn't right. The guys in the VIC chip said they could do a Z80 clock for me since I built it in. And it turns out they couldn't meet this voltage. It looked like this. Well, this is no good. This is only this wide. And so I ended up with this really kludge. You know, when you drive something high, it does this RC thing, right? It goes, oh, it slows way down. Well, I figured out if I did it to 12 volts and then used a transistor to chop it off, I walked around to every single, and the, so the transistor flips in polarity, right? I walked around to every single engineer I trusted and said, tell me why I can't make millions of it this way. Because I want to know. Because <laughs> if we put this out and pretty, you know, I mean, R doesn't work, but that didn't mean anything. And I've never seen anybody do that to a transistor where the, the, the input goes way past its, its collector voltage. See, the 12 volts, the 5 volts. So we took a chance and we did it. And, and this is why I start calling myself Captain Kluge. Because at this point, we can't change the design. We're starting to go into FCC. So I can add transistors and I can do cuts and jumpers, but I can't add stuff. Ah, here's an earth screw up. The caps lock key. We had never had one before. Anybody, you all know what happens when you press three keys at the same time? You get a phantom key. You can't tell if there's a fourth key or not. So if, you're, if you had a caps lock, a shift key, and a number. So the programmers are like, how do, how do you fix this? Well, we ended up using a spare pin. I, I, grabbed the, I grabbed the chip guy. I grabbed the programmer. We went in a room. I said, remember how we're, he can help you fix things? And all, you know that whole speech again. And we, uh, so we ran it to the 8502. We had a spare pin on it. Turns out the Z80 can't read this because it's on the 6502. So we didn't think about that. But that's, this was what was cool working at Commodore was you could repurpose a chip like that. So um, you'll hear me talk about chip layers. So the 8563 tried to screw us. That's the 80 column chip, right? And um, there's this thing called a back bias ring that ran around the chip. And the guy added it right in the middle as we're heading for CES show. He said, yeah, this will reduce power consumption. Well, what happened was he slowed the chip down and we lost our left column. The called eddy The eddy prompt. Well, I knew that this, this pin here connects to the substrate. 
And so I soldered a wire to here to here. It was actually 41 pins on this chip, right? And it worked. They, I mean, chip guys came in to look and stare and look at me and then look at the chip and stare and walk. But when the guy came in, he's like, what are you doing to my chip? He was mad that I was shorting out his chip to make it work. He's like, my child. But this is just one of the things we had to do to get to the CES show. Did you fix that for poor production? He had to. Meanwhile, it still didn't work. The, the real problem of the chip, he went through like nine revs of the chip and still didn't, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Meanwhile, I figure out why the CPM cartridge really didn't work. <laughs> you want to know why? Or? Here, I'll tell you, it's cool. We would let the Z80 go, clock, clock, stop, clock, clock, stop. And during that stop period, we would let it see the DRAM bus. Well, normally, when we went clock, clock, stop, it would put out a one or a zero. But if you caught it just right, it would do 1.25 volts. That's not a one, it's not a zero, it's a nothing. Well, the chips would start to oscillate. And it depended on what brand chips you had in there as to whether it would or not. Everybody assumed it was a speed problem because changing the chips. So we finally figured it out, it's like, oh man. So we had to make it so it would go clock, clock, stop, or sometimes just go clock, clock, clock. And this is where Frank Palea, the guy that worked for me, he did this mess because he had to. Uh, that's why I say he lost his virginity. Now he's kludging. We Remember, we can't add chips or anything, so that's where we've got all these onboard gates and stuff. He's making flip-flops and doing everything else in here. I mean, it's kind of a work of art if, you've, if you're sick. <laughs> but it worked. And, you know, it, it got us through it. Now, we couldn't use a PAL at the time, which they did have them, because they cost like $4.00 which to me, that's the equivalent, my, my end product cost is like 16 on that. And they're horrible for FCC. You know, in other words, we could have done this in a programmable piece of logic and you wouldn't see any of this, but we, this cost me almost a nickel to do all this, you know, in chip cost, because a chip cost me about a penny at the time. So, I had learned to get along with the guys in QA downstairs. And I'd even told them, when you get a problem, tell me first. Because the head of QA upstairs didn't like me. He had stood on a chair and basically said, the Commodore 128 won't work. And so any problem that came up, he'd say, see, I told you. So he's not helping us, he's just being an ass, basically. So I get this phone call, it goes, they're on the way up. And the movie Dirty Harry was out at the time. And if you remember the scene where he's eating a sandwich and, 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 and they start shooting at the bank. So I grab a sandwich, right? And here comes this rabble down the hallway and I'm chewing my sandwich looking at him like, what's up? And they had run the, let's see if we can run it. They had run this program. Anybody ever see Koala paint? Yep. So you see the length of time it takes to, to scroll and stuff. So this would start out blue, and then they would paint it red. And then this would happen. Here it is blue, here it gets to there. Well, we had moved the dot on the eye to make it look better in the font wrong. Well, it turns out Koala Paint was taking our font and making it bigger and whatnot. But because we'd moved the dot in the eye when it went to paint it, it accidentally painted the whole background. So the failure, really, I mean, it really worked. We had just moved the dot on the eye. So it turns out that we couldn't even move the dot on the eye and be compatible with the Commodore 64. So we ended up, we fixed everything in either overnight or in an hour, right? Um, bosses come walking back in. We did a technique called brick lane. We soldered a, the C64 font ROM right on top of it. And I ran a signal called 128 64 to it to decide which font ROM. So this was typical, I mean, this is just one of the days that, that we went through. Then the guys from Magic Voice show up from Commodore, Texas, TI guys. Everybody familiar with this, this you know, Commodore 64 cartridge, you've seen these before. There's these two little jumpers, Game and XROM, right? That most people solder, so it's either there or it's not. What this guy did was he would wait till the processor would go to start 
and he would jump in there. He would close those dynamically, and it would crash. Because he's trying to run C64 code, but we're a 128. We've got an MMU and everything else. So the managers leave for the night. I call up the guy that had done the Z80. He isn't home, but his wife's home. And she tells me the codes over the phone for booting a Z80. And we stuck a, an inverter in the uh, reset line. See, this used to be called high for Z80. It suddenly became low for Z80, because that's how it turned on. And so when management walked in the next morning, the Z80's doing the booting. And the Z80 boots from different memory. So we were able to, uh, another problem we fixed. So now the fact I built a Z80 in it's saving my ass. And then we made it then, the way to make all cartridges work was if you held down the Commodore key, it would put you in a C64 mode. So, and again, fixed overnight. So meanwhile, another chip broke. Um, Dave DiOrio had changed something in one of these to make it work. What happened was, when you wrote to the lower bank of 64K, you could see it in the upper bank. They bled through. And he couldn't understand why, so he was looking at it under the microscope. This is what he saw. We go to the bar. This is what he drank. I'm sitting there with him, and he develops the picture in his head that he had seen through the microscope and goes, they got the wrong layer. They had, done, they had switched layers 4, 5, and 6. That's why I had a thing earlier. But the fifth layer was an old one. And in his mind, he saw these contacts were in the wrong place. So it's like, we're even fixing, fixing the chips while sitting at the bar. Anybody ever hear this story? Nope. I still had issues. Oh, this is the Rev 6 board when we got it. Would suddenly crash. It looked like something barfed on the screen, right? <laughs> And I noticed that this at sign would appear almost always in the same place. But when a processor crashes and it's not due to software, it's very hard to catch because the problem occurred here and then the processor stumbles over it later, right? Well, what I did was I took, I still have this. This is my Commodore light pin. I stuck it in the, the, the joystick terminal. I ran it to this logic analyzer and ran it to this logic analyzer. And these are both on big scope carts, right? So they're like, and I put that light pin up against that screen, and when the at sign occurred, the analyzers triggered. And I was able to go in and see when the memory got corrupted. <coughs> and it all came down to there was this wire on, on one of the chips was just a little too long, right? It's called ground lift, ground bounce. So it was, it was funny that we were able to, you know, we had to use a light pin to catch that. Um, hole in the wall stories. Earl, I know you, you've heard these. Anybody want to hear the whole all stories or no? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yes. <laughs> we, everybody tried to stop us at one time or the other. So it was security's term, time to try and stop us. So they started locking my, my lab door. They didn't have a key. We didn't have a key. All I know is the door is locked. So we climb over the top. And you get that white crap all over you and everything. Unlock the door. We go back to work put up a sign said, please don't lock this door. It, there's no key. Next day, it's locked. Climb over again, and the sign changes to, don't lock the damn door. Door's locked again. This time, instead of crawling over, they say I punched through both sides of the wall in one punch. <laughs> it took two. But I, I put a hole right through where you could reach and unlock the door. They locked the door again. Now I'm getting the white crap on my arm, right? So the sign says, don't lock the fucking door. There's a hole in the wall. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the ones. The, the, other, the other hole in the wall story was, um, I was, I was kind of flighty back then, right? I was tense. They had thrown a fake brick at my head one time. And I had like thrown the papers in my hands and double hand pumped it into the trash can. And I started heading for the guy that threw the brick at me. And you know, he's like, <laughs> And my hands gave me an NMI interrupt says, we don't hurt. I'm like, what? That wasn't a real brick. Oh, <laughs> it's foam, right? But it looked like a real brick in flight. And they never threw anything at me again. But the technicians learned that if, if I was carrying a cup of coffee, if they would do like a fake punch, 
I'd get the coffee on myself because I'd just <laughs> unload the coffee. Well, I learned to throw the coffee on them. <laughs> right? So they stopped doing that for the most part. Well, one guy named Jeff, he, he dropped his shoulder like he was going to, going to punch. And I counted, I knew he had got one and a half steps behind me. I turned and I shoved him really hard and he went right into the wall. And the security cameras are like right here and here. And there's the back of the men's urinals. I'd never seen the back of the men's urinals before. This is pretty cool. And an expression on his face, because he's now in the wall like this. So we're walking away, trying to act like we didn't do it. He's got white shit all over his arm and stuff. So that's, that's the other one. And for the, so the QA manager that didn't like me, he, he ended up getting saddled with fixing this hole in the wall. And so we'd have to sit there in management meetings going, We've identified the contractor for the whole. Meanwhile, we're fixing a problem a day doing the doing the stuff. Anybody ever see this? The um, when they did it, they realized the font ROM was wrong for the V for the capital V. There was a bar over it. Our QA department had not even typed every single key. Right? Every shifted key. So we go in and we tell them, uh, we need to rev the ROM. Well, the, the head of software, <clears throat> and I swear he had a whiny voice, so when I do an impression of him, it's not me, it's him. He's like, well, this really is like a software thing. You, you've already screwed it up since you're in, well, I didn't screw it up, but you know, I, I released the ROM. So that's, I was a hardware engineer. So he said, I'll take it over. I'm like, fine, here it is. I need it by Tuesday. I, I had done, I didn't know they were called Gantt charts at the time, but I knew to get everything done in time that all these things had to occur at certain times. I said, fine, I need it the Tuesday, next Tuesday. Kept asking, how's it going? And we're, we're examining it, it's coming along fine. We're, Friday, I break into his office, I climb over the top, get the white crap all over me again. <laughs> Meanwhile, they'd put out a memo that said, stop breaking into offices, this means you, Bill Hurt. <laughs> they threatened to fire me for that, you know, but it wasn't my boss, so I didn't care. I stole the ROM out of his desk, it was sitting right, right there in the tray, I can still see it. And I released it to MOS on Friday, and so now I'm going to make my schedule. Tuesday, we're in the meeting. I said, so, how's that ROM coming along? Oh, it's still being examined. We're, I went, liar! <laughs> what this long-haired kids do? Liar, I broke into your office, I stole the ROM, I've already released it to, <laughs> to the thing. And they couldn't fire me because I got the ROM working right, right? That needs to say, I started to make some enemies as time went on. So, we're getting near the CES show. They make another change to a chip, right in the middle of it, and it doesn't work. It's the PLA this time. Now I noticed on the inputs, every input was shorted to every other input. And the, it, what had happened was this back bias ring that we talked about in the 8563, it had moved and it shorted. See these, these input pins there? It was now, every pin was shorted. And I got it working to prove it. I built a little tower and I had real hard drivers. And I wrote a memo saying I can fix that chip in three chips or something. And uh, so this is just an example. This is now the third week of December. And we've got CES in two weeks and this kind of crap's happening. So in this case, we, we, we ended up just using the, the same old PLA. But then we almost missed CES. The 8563, has anybody ever read the stories that I've written about how crazy this chip was? It broke left and right. Well, they had their own clock, <coughs> clock, and when you do that, it looks like this. There's no set time when something can happen, whereas this is our clock. And that's fine if the designer designed for it. Well, I was talking with him, and he hadn't designed for it. He felt that since it would break mathematically sometime anyways, why even try and reduce the number? Well, you know, if it broke once every four weeks, that's good enough for Commodore. But here it's breaking once every second, which meant you couldn't load the font ROM in it, right? And he's in denial. We, we go down to where he's doing it. He, he said, well, I wrote it in basic and I put a delay in it because it'd crash if I ran it too fast. I'm going, that's what we've been talking about. 
So here we are, almost not ready to make, being able to make CES, and we designed a phase lock loop tower that looked like this. I got this done in eight hours. This is a $1,200 PC board. And we sent a guy on a motorcycle to go pick him up. Nobody got any work done. We're all standing around the radio listening to the, the traffic reports, right? <laughs> There's a serious accident on Route 202. There's a motorcycle, PC boards all over the place. I mean, we're, we're just freaking out, right? But no, we, we put this in and suddenly it's time for CS. We actually got the, the thing working. I don't even know if I have, uh, but we get to CES, and it turns out that the guy who had done the CPM for us, Vaughn, whose name had a bar over it, he'd been working on an old version to, to, to make it work, and we didn't care because he needed to keep working. And the way he made it work was he would take his hot, um, Mr. Popcorn, Mr. Hot Air Popcorn Popper, and he would put an ice cube in the butter cup and set it on his chip and he could get about 20 minutes work out of each ice cube. <laughs> well, one of the problems he didn't know about was, you know, these chip designer, this chip designer, which I have the most respect for most of them and not this guy, right? And I should, but I, you know, I had to live with this problem. He had actually, he had installed a problem as we went through the revs. And we started again, we called it crying. When it scrolled, it would leave a character behind. So it looked like the matrix, way, way before the matrix. As the scroll, these characters would come down. And his recommendation to fix it was to write to the register twice. We called it, do it, do it now. He happened to be from Texas, so we called it a Texan write. <laughs> when, and the sound chip on the, C6, on the TED series, the guy who did the um, gate array was also from Texas, and he did the same thing. That's why we called it a Texan write. He's like, and if you want it done right away, write it twice. Well, to, to, what if there's an interrupt in between writes? I mean, you, you, you guys need to ask us <laughs> before you do. So Vaughn gets to, we get to the show. Vaughn shows up with his last version of CPM, and this happens. Vaughn sits down with the disk editor. We explain to him what's wrong. He can't compile CPM. That takes all kinds of equipment he didn't bring with him. But he sits down with the disk editor, and the bytes on the, in the sector are backwards, and the sectors are backwards, and then there's a checksum. He hand edits a disk to install the Texan write, and he fixes it. I mean, he's my hero, right? We're still fixing these major problems on the day of the CES show. Uh, and this is what the booth looked like. Can you tell it's the 80s? <laughs> so we sat up in a room while, while he did that. Let's see. Ah, here's the room Vaughn sat in. <laughs> And what you can't see, oh, it, here's like his CPM disks on the wall and stuff that he was doing. So uh, this, is, this is where, and we, the 80 column chips were still so broken that they had to ship one out to us. Like every person that showed up the, at the show, they would have one on a, on a velvet pillow for us. We get to the show, and these flyers are all over the Vegas airport. And on the way into the, uh, to, to the hotels, there's a billboard with this on it. The only problem is it's not true. It says expandable to 512K. My boss had said, eh. I, I said, I, I need the MMU rev for the 512. He said, no, not enough time. So every time management step, remember, stay ahead of management. Don't let them actually make decisions. So we had to do this guy, which was a DMA source. And it turned out to do something so what we're doing is we're shoving memory into it now. Instead of making it expandable to 512K, we've got an external 512K and a direct memory access controller. Headley Davis took the spinning, took the picture of the world, took the value of pi, and he made this globe. And so we're now we're doing animation because of a manager screw up. So this, this was a, a pretty cool thing for back in the 80s. The, um, the boards all have RIP, herd fish, Gway on it. What had happened in January was um, the, boss, the boss had to take off for a while, and the guy he left in charge in the drafting department took all the resources off the 128. Now, we've got to finish in January. Our FCC's done, and this is when you actually sell, the, you know, you, you make them in January so they're on the shelves by June or in the, you know, the channel for that Christmas. 
So when the boss gets back, he goes, everybody on the 128, I want all shifts available doing the PC board layout till it's done. So these three guys were the PC board layout guys. And they'd sit at this terminal. I mean, it didn't have auto routing. And they'd be moving stuff like this for eight hours, right? Then you'd see him start slowing down, getting winded. A guy come up, sit next to him. He'd start, oh, there's one, there's one. And as you watch, they would slowly shift positions and that new guy would take over and he'd be going fast. So we went all weekend doing three hour shifts, uh, three shifts. The problem was I had to be there the whole time so they could ask questions. And it's a cold room, it's, it's a, one of those, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, computer rooms. I had had a sleeping bag and my air mattress in there and my old army coat, and I slept in there. And I said, just tap me on the foot, and I, I, I could sit up, answer a question, and go back to sleep without actually waking up. And it was so cold in there that I bought the, the, uh, these Egg McMuffins on Friday, set them on the shelf, and they were still good Sunday. So that's where the RIP came from, though, is I, you know, I did like a 72-hour shift of, of, of layout. Post-CES, they canned the LCD. Uh, Jeff Porter had taken it over. Half our booth was dedicated to the LCD machine. The, there was an article from that Marshall Smith had uh, talked with the president of Tandy, Radio Shack, who told him there's no money in portables. I also had an article hanging next to it that said the highest single selling product for Radio Shack was their little LCD machine, that horrible blue and gold thing. And the sign under it said, this is what happens when you listen to your competition. So they can this. I found out just not long ago from talking to Jeff Porter, who again was in charge of it, that they didn't want the expense. Commodore was starting to run out of money without Jack Ran. They couldn't handle the expense of releasing a new product. So they picked one, the 128, instead of the, L instead of the LCD. I wish they'd picked the LCD, and I'm the guy who did the 128, because this was an evolutionary thing, and mine was just a stopgap measure you know, between, before the Amiga got here. So that was real sad. And the other thing that happened was we had designed it all along to be two computers, right? The flat, that big barn door, holder opener, flat thing. I like this one. This is the D, it had the built-in floppy and everything. This, it was plastic when it started, took the exact same PC board, and it was done at the exact same time, and it passed FCC. After I left, I was told that, no, it didn't pass FCC, and they never built it for like two years. And then they did that horrible metal version. And somebody said, mine's not so bad, so I don't mean to call yours bad, but I think it was even called Black Diesel or something like that in Germany. So I think the Germans did it, but this was the, the real sad thing is, this would have been a cool computer. This would have been a reason to, if you had a 64 and, and wanted to do something, you might as well get this thing with the built-in floppy and everything. So the one thing I still have people tell me is uh, when they reach, you know, talk, talk to me about the 128, they say, I learned a program on a 128. And the reason is, you know, we had the 40 column screen, the 80 column screen, we were bringing 80 columns to the home users. I think we were first for doing that. We have multiple processors, you know, all these things going on. And so if you wanted a game, you played the C64, but uh, developers kind of like the dual screen thing. So that, that was the, the kind of the takeaway from the whole uh, C128 era. So, and it's at this era that eight, we knew, I knew, the eight bits were done, you know? We, I called the 128 nine pounds of shit in a five pound bag because I couldn't quite get 10 pounds to fit. We got as much in there as we could in five months because we're sweeping house, right? We're turning out the lights on our way out the door of the 8-bit era. The Amigas are almost ready. I got goosebumps. Because it, it was, we knew it was that end of that era. You know? So that was like, that's, if you ever wonder, well, what's this pile of dung that's the 128? Well, it's everything we could sweep together and get done in five months. So, and then, then Act 3 started of, like I said, a Greek tragedy. As, as you all know, Commodore's not around anymore, and what should have been a great computer never got its chance. You know, it just never got marketed. Marketing, once again, kicked their feet up, said, well, this computer will sell itself. No, you, you gotta market it, you gotta sell it. So, that's the end of my slideshow. So, I appreciate everybody listening. If anybody's got any questions, shoot them out. Cool, thank you, everybody. Oh.
here's the question. Go ahead. Uh, I had heard that the MMU was originally designed to address like one megabyte of RAM. 512K. It, it, was, it, it, was, it was pin limited at the time. So I just didn't have enough pins. Uh, the registers might have been there, but again, my boss made the decision to not do it above 256K. So, but yeah, it, it could have done a me I mean, the same mechanism as just near two more bits in a register. So it was a marketing decision to limit it? It was my boss's decision. He, he got fired. I knew he was getting fired too. Um, <laughs> it, matter of fact, I said that to the Japanese right in front of him. I said, Shindo Musuga. He's like, what's happening? I said, soon to die. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to say he fired, so I said he's dying soon. Um, he had done something else too. He had told me to bugger the monitor output because we said the commoner, the Apple 80 column monitor used like the vertical and horizontal going high, the IBMs used it going low, and he told me to make it do one of each so that we, you'd have to buy our monitor. Well, if I had done that, we wouldn't have sold 80 column monitors. They weren't done. They weren't done for like nine months. So you wouldn't, all the 128s would have had no CPM and no, no support right away. So it's the only time I ever lied to my boss. And it was lying by kind of an omission. He's like, you take care of that? I'm like, it's taken care of. You're about to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> but and again, I knew that he didn't. But so no, I, I, and somebody even wrote about that in the magazine that said, you know, mine's trained in marketing and stuff. It don't make sense when you think. So I made it be just the standard, and I hid it in the design so he could look at it and not tell I was lying to him. So, sorry. <laughs> there was never any plan to do an OS using the MMUs, because it was really going to be 64 compatible. We either going to run uh, you know, Well, I made the MMU go away in Commodore 64 mode. Okay. And, and we did that on purpose. And uh, Freddie Bowen had mentioned it. He said, don't mess with the definition of what Commodore 64 is. Because we've got all these programs that are Commodore, well, what if there's versions of it now that only run on a 128 and 64 mode? That's not a good gift to give back, right? Because we're, we're going for this purity. So at the, at the very last minute, I disabled the bid on the very last rev of the chip that once you went into 64 mode, you stayed there. Uh, and so a kid walks up to me at CS show and he looked at me, I swear he went like this. He goes, if, if I had designed it, I'd have found a way to leave the MMU in there in 64 mode. <laughs> I was like, kid, <laughs> I made it go away on purpose. <laughs> so yeah, no, we did not want to mess with it. But the MMU, like I said, is just like the MMUs we use today as far as banking and had pre-stored profiles and stuff, ex except I didn't have a supervisor, because there was no supervisor bit in the processor either, so I, I just didn't think of it. Is there uh, any good information on uh, how the MMU works out there available somewhere? I don't even remember how it works. Because I've been, I've been trying to find information on how it works for probably probably over a year now. I've not been able to find I mean, I've bought books. I've bought, I just can't find mm -hmm. very good detailed information on how it actually works. Yeah. I, I can tell you what it takes to make one that looks like it works. <laughs> It's, it's actually not, it's just a bunch of registers and pointers, as is life in general. <laughs> Almost there. Before there was an MMU, I had to make an MMU out of chips. So this is how many chips it takes to emulate an MMU. So uh, it's not hard, but without the manual, yeah, it could be a little tough. So that's how you, that's how you make an emulated MMU. Um, the MMU actually has a register in it that flips, it's that Z80 enable line that was high for Z80 and now it was low because we made it boot first. So it's a, you actually write to a register and the other guy kicks on and he can see the MMU also so he can flip it back. So, all right, thank you everybody. Thank you.